So I want to continue the discussion that we started this morning about uh, key issues and opportunities with regard to food. I think I do. <laughs> so one of the issues that we have to address is that in the next 40 years, we have to produce as much food as we have in the last 8,000. And we have to do it not just about calories, but about nutrients, about availability, about affordability. And we've got to do it within the limits of the planet. So today, we have one unit of consumption for 7 billion people. That's about 7 billion units of consumption. By 2050, the average consumer globally is going to have 2.9 times as much income. And they're going to double the amount of food they buy. And that's 18 billion units of consumption. To make that fit on one planet, we have to shrink the amount of inputs we use, the land, the water, the nutrients, etc., by 75 percent. So this is all about continuous improvement. What is more sustainable today won't be tomorrow. And it'll be the practice that we have to change the day after tomorrow. So what's driving the speed and scale of change? It's development. It took the UK 155 years with 9 million people to double GDP. It took the US 53 years with 10 million people to double GDP, and it took China 12 years with a billion people. It took India 16 years with 822 million people. Since that time, China has increased GDP by another 178 percent, and India is on track to do the same thing by 2020. So, we're dealing with a speed which is 12 times what the Industrial Revolution was and a scale that's more than 100 times. This is the challenge going forward. What China did, what India has done, what governments around the world are doing is exactly what we want them to do. They're lifting people out of poverty. And those people have more income. And they have access to better nutrition and they're consuming more. What we didn't anticipate was what the impact of that increased consumption would be on food prices. And as a result, we started seeing commodity price spikes. And from those price spikes, in conjunction with climate change, when Russia closed its borders to exports, we started seeing food riots. We started seeing people dying in food riots in 23 countries around the world. Now, if you look at today's map for 2015, those areas where we saw the Arab Spring still have political conflicts. They involve about 9 million people in North Africa and the Middle East. But Asia has twice as many people that have been displaced by natural disasters, at least some of which, if not many of which, are related to climate change. It's those kinds of displacement that are going to start having political implications later. So I would ask you, how much does it cost to fix a problem before it happens versus trying to fix it after it happens? Those are the ways we need to start thinking. So regardless of what many think around the world, as we move into a more nationalistic phase of human history, trade is essential. Comparative advantage is real, and we need to produce products where we can to supply it to uh, the food to populations that are either in need because of bad weather, because of political turmoil, etc. And yet, we see a concentration. So with oil seeds, 95% of global trade comes from eight countries. With cereal grains, it's 80 to 85 percent comes from the same eight countries. If we have drought in any of those eight countries, it's going to affect 
prices and it's going to affect the availability of food going forward. So we need to begin to look at those kinds of issues more carefully. I think what this means is that in the 21st century, sustainability has to be a pre-competitive issue. Governments need to work with governments around food security. Companies need to work with other companies around food security. Traders need to work with other traders. Producers need to work with other producers. We can't do this alone. And I would say even with regard to innovation and venture capitalists, we need to find models where we can pool our work, focus on a few problems, and figure out how to bet on every horse in the race so that we can come up with the innovations we need moving forward. So right now, the issue isn't what to think about food security, about how we produce enough food or how we distribute it. Uh, it's how to think. There is no silver bullet. There isn't a single recipe. I think if we focus on productivity and efficiency on the one hand, and waste and consumption on the other, we can get there. But none of these by themselves will be enough. So we have to work at all of them together. On a finite planet, we need to ask ourselves, should consumers have a choice about sustainable products? Or should all the choices be more sustainable? In the US, the average consumer takes about 2.4 seconds to make a choice. In Europe, it's a little longer, 3.5, 3.7 seconds to make a choice. I don't know what it is in Asia, but it's probably not a lot more. How much can you actually consider when you're spending two seconds making a choice, or three seconds, or four seconds? The other issue is that today we have 7.5 billion food experts on the planet. And you're not going to tell them what to do about food. They speak 6,000 languages, they represent many different cultures, and I think we have to figure out how we're going to work with them, how to make them more informed about the choices of their consumption. Waste. We waste one in three calories today. Waste is half of the new food we need to produce by 2050. There are opportunities there for every sector. Genetics. We would be hunters and gatherers without genetics. So we need to figure out not if genetics, but which genetics. And we need to start using genetic solutions on diseases and pests uh, and, other, and other ways to increase overall net productivity. We need to rebuild soils instead of expanding into new areas. And we can do that with a target of 250 million hectares. We've set up this target with the World Bank and now the UN. Rebuilding soils was the thing of governments in the past. Today, we think it's going to be more the thing of the private sector, of producers, of companies. But we've got to figure out how to do it better. Today, we use one liter of water to produce one calorie of food. By 2050, we're going to have to use half a liter of water to produce two calories of food. That is the challenge. I've spent most of my life developing certification programs and standards for improving productivity of, of small farmers, medium-sized farmers, etc. But what I've come to realize is rewarding the best doesn't actually eliminate the problems. The pop, bottom 25% of all producers on the planet produce about 50% of the impacts, but only about 10% of the product. So if we want to produce more and have fewer impacts, we focus on working with the bottom, not with the top. And to move the bottom, we actually need to work with government. So I'm getting a sign here saying time's up, but I had 15 minutes, not 10, so reset the clock. One of the ways we work with the bottom is through a program called the Better Cotton Initiative, which focuses on metrics and continuous improvement. It doesn't care where a producer starts, 
but the idea is that they will move and become better against key impacts. And as you can see, with about 1.6 million producers, they've reduced pesticide use, water use, fertilizer use, and in fact, increased productivity and increased net income. This is about getting them better over time. This is the kind of continuous improvement we actually need. And then there's climate change, which we think is a much bigger issue, and it's happening much faster around the world than we've, than we've been hearing about. This is the projection of the impact on paddy rice of climate change by 2050. The yellow and the red areas are places where there will be less production. Imagine that. Those entire areas. Production is moving north and moving west. And this is the context in which we have to double production. So we have producers that are producing less, and yet somehow we need to come up with more food. This is a huge challenge. China's One Belt, One Road program is moving into exactly the areas that are both going to be producing less as well as the areas that are producing more. This program is intended to facilitate trade of raw materials, of commodities. But imagine that these de development quarters, if we also have a drought in India or a drought in China, are going to be corridors for people to move. You saw what happened in Europe when one, two million people from the Middle East started moving into to Europe. Imagine five or 10 million people moving into the stands or into the Russian Far East. What's going to happen in those places? So who's moving sustainability of raw materials from niche to norm? The Global Salmon Initiative represents 70% of global salmon production. They have actually all agreed to work together to share information about how to reduce impacts, what works, what doesn't work, what the payback period is, what the return on investment is. No other sector has done that, but this is exactly the way we can learn faster. We need more sectoral approaches like the Global Salmon Initiative. Board BIA, the Irish government, has actually set, stand, uh, set a, uh, a timeline that by 2016, they will, in fact, only export more sustainably produced food. It's the only government that has made a commitment like that. They didn't achieve it, but they got 80% of dairy producers and 75% of beef producers into that system, sharing information, getting access to data about how their neighbors are improving production, and the whole system is moving forward. Other countries need to follow that. A lot of companies are beginning to work on greenhouse gas emissions. Walmart has made a commitment. They've already achieved a one gigaton reduction in their own operations, and now they've challenged their suppliers to achieve another gigaton of reductions. Marks and Spencers is buying all their renewable energy from the same producers that they buy their animal protein from, produced from biogas and methane. And now companies are beginning to look at, can they buy soil carbon? Can they buy organic matter? Can they buy sequestered carbon, a ton of carbon and a ton of commodities from the same companies that they buy their raw materials from? This is the future of how we integrate a problem and a solution. I think we also need to change the business model. A 1 or 2 percent increase in productivity, a 1 or 2 percent increase in price is not going to help small farmers. We're just maintaining poverty. We've got to figure out how to move forward at scale. One of the ways to do that is to invest integrated land. Can, if land titles are the issue, and land titles are the issue with individuals, can we then begin to look at communities? Can we do employee stock option plans? Can we do joint ventures between communities and traders or processing companies so that the communities and the people they represent have equity downstream in the processing plant? They make money on growing the product, but they also make money on the value added. This is fundamentally changing the system. There's the issue of traceability and transparency. 
where now it's not just a question of where something was produced, it's how it was produced. In the 19th and 20th century, we focus on creating products, commodities that were substitutable for each other. And by the end of the 20th century, we wanted to know where those products came from. In the 21st century, the game has changed. We want to know about externalities. We want to know about how that product was produced. Was there slave labor? Was there child labor? Was there deforestation? Was there habitat conversion? How much water was used? What was the quality of life of the producer? Did they make enough money to have a meaningful uh, wage? Did they have a good diet? So, as we say where I come from, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. We know where we have to be by 2050. There's something that everybody can do Think about it. Thank you.